Uh, good evening. Thank you all for attending tonight's Rolling Hills Community Meeting. I'm Bill Pando, Seminole County's Greenway and Natural Lands Division Manager. We are excited to be able to bring to, bring to you tonight the latest plans for your community. We have a lot of information. As a lot of you know, we have been working very hard to get all this point, get to get to this point. It has been a very difficult challenge. We will, be, we will be providing you with both parks and the roadway plans. We have Commissioner Constantine here tonight with us and also staff from Public Works and Parks. In addition, we have folks from our consultant, GAI and HDR. I'd like to introduce you to Commissioner Constantine. Thank you. <laughs> you know we can finish. Okay, guys. Um, we told you we'd keep you informed. We told you we would get people in the community involved. I think we're doing that. I'm trying to do that continue. Now, there, um, there have been some questions down there. I, I diverted them all because I wanted everybody to have the ability and the opportunity to see this from both the parts perspective and the transportation perspective. And as you all know, at the last meeting, they took a lot, the staff of the, and, the, and the engineers and the consultants took a lot of notes. They tried to incorporate a lot of the concerns. I'm sure, and please understand, this is not a finished product. I'm sure they might have missed something. Or, for whatever reason, they couldn't do what you wanted them to do exactly. But give them an open mind. Let's look at this. I will tell you there is more resources in the county going into this than practically anything else. We want to make this a showcase for the entire region. I understand the historic values and the opportunities that we have in this community. And for those of you that don't know, and I think all of you probably do, I grew up in this neighborhood. So this is just as important to me as it is to anybody in the county. So tonight what we've done is we've got both our parks of uh, consultant and our transportation consultant. Those pretty pictures out there will still be there, but they're going to go through them, I assume, also right now. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'm going to I'll be here for the whole thing. And I am seeing a lot of this for the first time also, although I know what we've also asked them to do. So with that, let's let them go through the program. Pete, would you like me to do, um, okay, you're up there for what I'm saying is, let them ask you questions on the parks first before we go to Jeff and the transportation, or would you guys like to wait till the very end? I think we'd like to just go through the whole thing. Okay, the yeah. whole thing. Put yeah. yours and his. Yeah, yeah. Did everybody hear that? So let's hold the questions until they're completely done, and then we can go back to whatever you're concerned about. And we will. Trust me. We will. I will make sure they do. So Pete Settler is here, and if I said it wrong, Pete, it's only a week ago. GIA consultants, Trent, this is on the parks. Okay, Pete. All right, thank you. Good evening. Um, first thing I want to do is, um, besides thanking the, uh, you know, Commissioner Constantine and, and the county staff, which is fabulous, I actually want to recognize the Lyman High AV team. They're here tonight helping us, and we've got some of the best AV ever, and I do a lot of presentations, so I have a point of reference here. And I also have a daughter that goes to another high school who's in the theater department, and you know, I, I really appreciate what the students are doing, and um, you know, they've got their teacher here, and they're gonna do a great job for us tonight, and I appreciate them taking some extra time. Um, how many of you, is there anyone that has never been to a Rolling Hills Park presentation? Like this whole thing is brand new. Okay, so we have one, maybe two people. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go kind of fast because I think the main thing that's kind of driving the discussion tonight is how the streets and parkways and traffic calming items kind of marry up to the park. And so I want to make sure that there's plenty of time for Jeff Arms with HDR to kind of make that connection for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of go through 
you know, very quickly the history of the, of the project. I think many of you know it. Um, refresh just quickly on the master plan for the park. I do have an update on a couple of things that we've done based on community comment. Specifically, probably the headliner is relocating the playground to the site where the old golf clubhouse used to be, which I think has actually turned out very exciting. Um, I've got Ian Mulgard here with me who's been um, part of that design team. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. So let me just, let me just dive in here. Um, so uh, around 2014, the golf course closed. It became essentially a defunct property. Um, economically, financially defunct, but also physically defunct. And as, as the commissioner said, this is, this is a really one of the center, centerpiece developments in Seminole County. And you, know, you can't let that go fallow. It's a beautiful green space. It's got wonderful mid-century housing, great neighborhood, great quality of life. And so there's a lot of discussion about what do we do with this property. And I think the county really showed a lot of leadership. If I go back 10 years in time, you know, this idea of repurposing golf courses was a pretty new idea um, nationally. And I think the Seminole County has gotten way ahead of that curve in terms of taking charge of these kinds of properties. So then the question becomes, well, what should we do with it? What should it look like? So the community vision was a park. Um, and, and, and specifically probably a passive recreation park as opposed to things with a lot of ball fields and lights and things like that. But then you start to get into, okay, what kind of design language or design inspiration should you use you know, to design an 18-hole you know, golf course into something that really feels like a park? And so the language that we went to um, with Rick Durer, who couldn't be here tonight, um, is really some of the original American park design language from Frederick Law Olmsted, who did Central Park, the, the Boston Emerald Necklace, and, and parks all over, the, all over the country. And it really has to do with um, uh, open space that, that allows for um, personal reflection, personal connection to nature, um, the idea of outdoor rooms for different types of activities. It has to do with views. It has to do with, with really kind of, there's this idea about recreation, and, and Mr. Olmsted's had this alternate term called recreation, which had to do with reconnecting to nature. So we really want to try to create something that capitalizes on the qualities of the site, builds up the tree canopy over time, and also allows people lots of different ways to come in here and sort of experience this as a natural green space. Even though it's designed, it will feel natural. So we did a number of renderings, and I got to credit Ian with the uh, 3D renderings, but taking things like Lake Jeanette, which again, kind of gone a little fallow, and, and let's go and re-celebrate the ecology of the edge of the lake, and let's bring people to the water and let them experience you know, that natural aspect of the Florida um, ecosystem. Um, opportunities where we've got significant grade change. This site has actually got like 180 feet of grade change on it, which in Florida is, you never see that. So for me as a designer and for our team, anytime you've got grade change, it's, it's a great opportunity because we get to do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do. So we've got things where there's terraces and overlooks and we can create little knolls and, and some really great kind of interactive experiences as you walk through the park. Um, We've got places where you can see the kind of knolls here um, looking down and we can really shape those into something that starts to feel like kind of an outdoor gathering area. Um, maybe have very small like acoustic performances, little plays in the park, things like that. Um, theater for kids. So there's a whole set of those kinds of experiences that, that I think we all know about when we think of places like Central Park, and we can deliver that sort of thing here. So we had a phase one master plan that we spent some time working with the community on and, and with, the, with the staff and the commission and, and so forth. And um, uh, it essentially what it does, it takes all the, fair, it takes all the fairways and it, it names them. And if you look at them online, and I'm going to have some links for you later, you'll see that each of the fairways is actually given a name. And the name isn't so much about, you know, titling it, it's about a way of thinking about that space. So that when you're in something like the Geyer, or you're in something like the Highlands, or you're in the Grove, or you're in the Arboretum, it kind of connotes you know, a set of experiences and activities that you can have there that help us kind of inform how to turn something that really is a pretty consistent, you know, physical space 
clear fairways, some trees on the edges, that's a golf course. You know, how do you turn that into something that really feels like a park? Um, and so that's, that's kind of how we're doing that, is we're thinking about different places, different types of experiences. We're working with a paved trail that's gonna be 12 feet wide, four miles long in a continuous loop with lots of secondary trails. We're gonna do some landscaping and earthwork. We're really gonna work on the tree canopy. Um, we're gonna have bridges and terraces and, and good ADA access and, and overlooks. Um, we're going to have a whole variety of site furnishings and playgrounds and um, interpretive signage. Um, we have a great grant um, arrangement with Florida Communities Trust. So, um, you know, we're going to work on that. So, um, what, I, what I want to kind of focus on just to sort of close my part is, um, and I will show you where you can go online and see the entire plan for the park in, in a lot of detail. Um, but what I want to focus on is since, we, since the last time we really talked about the park, there was a desire to move the playground, I don't know if this, I can get a laser up here, from this area here down to the location of the old clubhouse. And um, so we've done that. And in fact, where we are right now with design is we are completing three parallel separate design packages. They're in the computer, they're in construction document format, we're bringing them home. The first package is about the trail itself. So that's the four mile long continuous 12 foot trail and that will be packaged with the street improvements so that you can essentially have the asphalt contractor go out there and do all of that as sort of one project. Then there's another package that starts to focus in on some of the key amenity areas within the park. Like for instance, you can see on the bottom here the, those terraces that I showed that go down to the, to the pier um, on the lake. And then there's a third package that's focused specifically on this playground. Um, so we are plowing ahead and we're making really good progress um, on getting this to a place where it can be bid, put out for, put out for construction, and we can get started. Um, so with that, let me just show you a couple of ideas about the playground and then we'll move on and talk about the streets. Um, so again, you, you see the location here in the center. Um, you can see the, the kind of color here just on, on top of the lake. That's, that's where the clubhouse was. There happens to be a, quite a bit of grade there. I mean, is it 30 feet, 40 feet, Ian? I mean, it's, it's quite a bit. So for me, grade change is like, I, I just hear, you know, design opportunity is the bells that go off in my head. So we want this to be an inclusive playground. And what that means is really um, choices for people of all ages from, you know, 18 months all the way to, you know, 88 years, you know, whatever, however you want to define that, but also opportunities for folks with different ability levels and different ways in which they might want to engage. Um, and that includes people that might, you know, they may, they may have, um, uh, a physical um, disability and they have to engage differently. Folks that are, you know, maybe have autism or other types of um, things that kind of change what their interactions might want to be in a playground. And we have enough space and enough opportunity here to make what I think is really a national class inclusive playground to serve the entire community in a, in a really neat way. Um, what you see when you look at it is um, a lot of kind of subspaces, I'm not, I, it's really hard for me to do a pointer here, um, but what you see is a lot of subspaces. So we can create different playground areas to house different types of activities and they can be kind of, they're connected but they're kind of separate. They have different individual kind of rooms for how um, uh, folks can interact and use that play equipment. Um, here's a view of it, you can see the pavilion restroom building adjacent to the parking lot um, on the far left at the top of the hill. You come down the hill through a variety of um, play spaces. You can see that there's pathways that connect out to the general park. And on the right, you can actually see that terrace element um, rising up from the, from the um, uh, decking um, on Lake Jeanette. Um, incidentally, the things that we've shown paved in white are meant to be with the playground and the, the kind of gray um, is meant to be the, the large four mile, 12 foot wide regional trail that, that connects everything. Um, you can see here looking down towards the lake from above. Um, the, the architecture, and we have a great architectural partner, Rhodes and Brito, um, here in town. 
Um, the, I think the inspiration for the architecture kind of comes out of the language and the time period of the homes. I mean, a lot of the homes are kind of what we would call mid-century modern. There's a lot of ranches. There's a lot of things with kind of stone uh, veneer um, on the housing. Um, a lot of kind of flat roof and plain. It's almost kind of some Frank Lloyd Wright language. So we're kind of using that as sort of our jumping off point for some of the architectural elements in the park. So this would be a restroom and pavilion uh, building that would sort of overlook and, and welcome people into the playground from the parking lot. Um, there will be some, obviously, indoor spaces for the restrooms, right, but, but also some outdoor kind of covered gathering spaces um, as well as you can see here in the foreground. And then you can step down into the playground. And, and as I said, with, with, with this grade change situation, we have to make everything ADA accessible. So we've got some places where we might need to do steps and, you know, maybe go down four or five feet like you have right here. But then we've got to do an ADA ramp like you have right there so that everybody, you know, of all ability levels can access the next room. So that creates a whole series of really interesting design opportunities, which I think are going to create for great views, great, um, great ways for folks to interact, for people watching, um, for people to be um, uh, quiet and, and kind of have their own level of play, and as well as other places where you might have a whole bunch of, of folks um, enjoying the playground together. I mean, I think it's, it's important to create places where, where folks can, can interact in small groups as well as big groups. And I think this playground opportunity and moving it to this site, um, it's not what we predicted maybe when we started the project, but I think it's turned out to be a wonderful design refinement. And I'm very, very excited about this space. Um, one of the things, I'm, gonna, I'm almost done here, one of the things that's in it that I personally think is fun, and I've worked on a lot of parks, we wanted to have a big hill. Um, I've worked on some projects where, where, you know, it's so hard to get up in the air in Florida. And to have a playground that actually has a hill that the kids can roll down, they can climb up, they can roll things down to each other, you, wouldn't, you can't imagine how kids will dive into something like this because frankly they don't see it very often in Florida. It's just not a thing. So this is going to be a super fun space. And then as we get to the edges of sort of the playground, the language becomes a little bit less intense and it starts to grade into that more passive tree, canopy, soft kind of park um, design language that we're using for the balance of the park. We also have some green design, green infrastructure going on here where we're going to be capturing the stormwater from the parking lot and from um, other elements that are sort of up the hill. And we're going to be filtering them um, down into Lake Jeanette. So we have nice clean water coming into Lake Jeanette. Um, and then we'll kind of be peeling off at the edges in a very casual way into Rolling Hills Park. And then there will be kind of a center, you know, kind of a more formal kind of center entrance into the playground to sort of connect the building to the lake in a more formal way um, um, in the center of the composition. So with that, um, we're going to move into the streets. And I guess while, while Jeff's coming up here, what I would tell you is um, within the context of the park design, you know, there's a long tradition of how streets and parks come together. And, and, and so what Jeff's going to talk about, I, I have a couple kind of lead-in slides, but this language of really streets that come into a park and they're part of the park experience and they really are parkway streets and they're really about, they're really about pedestrians first, bicycles second, and cars, you know, slow moving cars, you're facilitating cars getting through, but they're really doing it on the terms of the park and on the terms of the neighborhood. And I think that's what, um, that's what our goal is, is to create that kind of situation here. And I think HDR has got some really great concepts that they've been working with the staff on. So Jeff's gonna take you through that. Sir. Thank you very much. Good. Just so you know, I grew up on Roxborough Road 
you all remember the, um, it was the showcase of homes in 1968. Anybody there then? Okay. That's what I'm doing then. Okay? And I will tell you, I also, you know, I went to London High School. I was captain of the swing team. We practiced in that swing team there at Rolling Hills. So, um, I'm sorry? It needs a place. Yeah, it needs a place. But I was just thinking, if, if I had lived there when they had that hill, I know I would have gotten somebody, or I would have run around there and run somebody to put snow there so I could get a shed. <laughs> so I could go down that hill. So um, I'm sure that'll be something that'll come up at some point. But we now have the roads, and I'd like to introduce uh, Jeff. Um, AT of arms. arms. I'm yeah. sorry if you're. The arms like a T. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff Arms from HER and he and his team has been the one that's done the street and more importantly the traffic calm that will be part of this whole park system. So Jeff, go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, this is an exciting opportunity and Pete did a great lead in for me. As but the commissioner introduction is always always special, so I appreciate that. Um, this is a special connection because we recognize how close it is to Seminole Wakaiba Trail. Um, I, I live to, to a little bit to the south of here, but I do go up to Seminole Wakaiba Trail. It's my favorite trail in the region. It's the most shaded. And the opportunity that to connect this network to Seminole Wakaiba Trail as best as we can um, with I-4 being a barrier, but it really has reinforced the importance of the trail connectivity and thinking through the road improvements and how important the trail connections are. Um, with the rolling hills, when we first started in the planning phase study, it was like, what are the goals of these types of improvements? And the first one, of course, is the safety. Safety always comes first when you're dealing with transportation, and then it's about the mobility and focusing more on the active transportation and connecting the, uh, the trail network, and then just the livability. It's landscaping, green space, being able to make it part of the park network. So when we developed the plan and the concept and we've been refining it, we've, we've had like a menu of different types of improvements so that we have some place making opportunities and we haven't done the same type of improvement and, and throughout the entire area. We've, we've varied the, the traffic calming techniques we've done because sometimes specific locations call for different techniques to be better suited to, towards that. Um, but we really recognize that it's all about better connectivity and allowing the neighborhood to get better access to the park network and the trails. So we've had a couple of public meetings and I know I appreciate all the patience of the team um, and, I, and really the residents, um, you know, you're anxious and want to see improvements happen. So we've had a, an open house back in 2019. We got a lot of ideas and suggestions. We had a public meeting in 2022 where we continued to refine then things. And since then, we've done so much collaboration with the parks team and with uh, fire and other departments in the county to continue to moving things forward. Um, a big part of this, and I've heard a lot of like com uh, conversation about, well, why do we have roundabouts in this project? Why do they make sense at certain locations? And the one thing that roundabouts uh, you know, are, are not as common in Florida, but what they do do is they do make people slow down and not have um, inner conflict points with other vehicles at high speeds at right angles. Because at traffic signals especially, when there are conflict points at high spe higher speeds at right angles, um, when there's collisions of those types, those tend to be much more serious or potentially fatal. So there's a lot of data and statistics that show that with the round, proper design of a roundabout greatly reduces that. Does it reduce fender benders by compared to a signalized intersection? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is it, it, the high kinetic energy violent collisions that could happen, it greatly reduces those and it's a much safer technique especially if you're trying to have people that are on bikes and walking crossing these streets. Um, the other advantage, and when I, I've heard this conversation from people, does anyone else drive on Sunday morning to go get their coffee? And it's real quiet, there's not a lot of people out on the roads, but yet you're sitting at that light that, for like two minutes, 
Well, that doesn't happen with roundabouts. When it's quiet and there's not other traffic there, you don't even have to fully stop. You can just slowly navigate through the roundabout. It actually saves you time throughout most of the day and you just need to navigate it safely and cautiously. We want people to drive a little bit slower and cautiously through the roundabout. Be a defensive driver. Everyone is getting used to that type of um, condition and that, like I said, those type of violent collisions um, have been greatly reduced with roundabouts. Plus it's a great ch chance for some landscaping um, without vehicles stopping and starting. It's, it's not as noisy um, and there's less you know, air pollution. So let's think through the roundabout placement. Uh, we didn't just pick random intersections by chance about where to put them. We've got this great park design and the concepts. So where we've got these trails that are all kind of converging in this. Pete talked about the entire um, network. And so what I've outlined in the, in the orange is, is like the trail network. And then I'm overlaying the busier residential collector streets. These are the streets that, are, that have the highest traffic in the neighborhood. Um, and as you're cutting, as, as traffic is, is, you all are entering and exiting the neighborhood. And some people do, you know, we acknowledge there's other traffic that's, that's accessing things in the area. So what we have done is the, the roundabout locations are where those trails converge. We, it is the most proven way to slow traffic down because they have to make a turn, yield to other cars, and travel through the roundabout. <laughs> And it also makes it so when a pedestrian or a trail user is crossing the traffic, they're crossing in two stages. Every single roundabout location we put in, we have a refuge so you can cross half, one lane, look for a gap, and then cross the other lane after you look for the gap in the other direction. And that it's better than just a raised median, a raised crosswalk, because not only do you have, um, you know, slowing, you're slowing the traffic down and you're allowing the two-stage crossing. So a median would just be a two-stage crossing. But with the roundabout, you're forcing the vehicles to slow down to make that crossing. And that's why we focus a lot of the, the trail crossing networks at these locations. So now I want to walk you through just uh, the, the, the boards. And when you, well, my team will be out there to answer questions as long as the school lets us. Um, after the presentation as far as detailed location questions. I'm here to answer general questions like the rest of the team. But if you have a specific question about a driveway or what's happening at this particular crosswalk or really close by, those are probably best use of everyone's time if we go out to the boards and, we, and we've got these boards. Um, we have two sets, they're the same on each side. And then we have um, the three roundabouts like blow ups of those showing like the, the landscape of the roundabout and how it would integrate with the landscape of the park. And we've done our best job to kind of uh, put the park illustration and merge it with the, uh, the roadway design plans for right now as far as the illustration purposes. So there's a couple places where it doesn't line up exactly right, but we're working through the details of the design so they will when they go to construction plans. So we just make sure you keep that in mind. So this is Raymond Avenue, and you can see some of the highlights that we have. We have the trail connection along 434 um, out to some of Wakaiva. We have the gateway roundabout, which is where the trails converge. Three different trails coming together. So we've made it with the roundabout that you can connect in th you know, the three different directions. And then we've integrated the, um, uh, some, some raised crosswalks along a couple parts of Raymond to space out and slow down traffic at the point, appropriate points. And we've placed those at neighborhood uh, residential streets that, where people would want to have access to the park. Um, you can see we've added, um, increased the pond size. Um, we call that the Bernard Pond. And we, you can kind of look on our exhibits out there where the existing pond in is, and then you can see where we've shaded out over the existing earth. And we've increased the pond size because we know that there's flooding concerns in the area. And we've done a lot of deep analysis, and we've taken into account those flooding concerns. And we increased the pond size, and the park um, design has taken that into account. So we're working on one team uh, towards that effort. And then you can see the, the view on the upper right. Okay, so let me just explain. We've heard a lot of comments about 
the intersection of 434 and Raymond, especially to Carlton Street. Um, here's some of the existing concerns that we've heard. Um, it's a tight turning radius when you're heading down 434 and turning right into the neighborhood. You have some bigger vehicles, it's just not quite as smooth. Um, there's an, only an existing six foot sidewalk on top of the curb on both Raymond and 434. And then you have the southbound left um, that's to Carlton Street, especially I know the church has access to that quite a bit throughout the day. And some of the traffic, because it's just a painted island on Raymond, they start using that to bypass the queue and they start going in the northbound lane. They're not supposed to, we'll observe that. And then we have the crosswalk that is along Carlton that actually doesn't line up where the sidewalk is on Carlton. The sidewalk's on the south side of the street. Um, so with what we've done is we've addressed a lot of these issues as best as we can. We've increased the turning radius um, to smooth things out at 434. We've added the 10 foot connection um, along um, Raymond and then out along 434 towards I-4 to connect to Seminole Kaiba best we can. We relocated the crosswalk south of um, Carlton Street so it lines up with the, the, the sidewalk on Carlton Street and now that anyone crossing um, Raymond at the crosswalk where technically you're supposed to yield to the pedestrian in the crosswalk but now on the south side there's the median so that somebody could yield at least halfway or have a more consciously be aware of where vehicles are and they're not stuck in the middle worried that someone's going to be going through the turn lane. Um, we've added a new raised island and we're looking at some potential curbing or a separator um, to make it so vehicles don't try to cheat and go through um, the turn lanes in that area. We're very constrained in the width um, bit along Raymond for the right-of-way. This whole project's being done without acquiring new right-of-way. We have a pinch point just south of Carlton, so even if we were to increase the pond and, or impact the pond area, we'd still have the same pinch point. So that's really been the controlling, um, controlling feature. And then you can see, lastly, that the northbound left, the northbound movement used to just be one lane um, north of Carlton. So once you get through the Carlton intersection heading north um, towards 434, you, it opens up to two lanes right away, providing more stores, easier traffic flow, and it's smoother. Sorry to go into so much detail. Detail. Yeah, let me just, no, let me just interrupt right there. This is the first really good image. Go forward. There you go. Okay. I just want to make a note. I, uh, those last few slides were really washed out. So I think there's a, maybe a, uh, one of the CMYK settings on the projector is maybe a little too yellow or something. So as he was showing those images, you know, after the meeting, oh, I can we tell you. discuss them out front with the posters. And you can see them, you know, much more clearly. But this, the rest of them are going to look like this. That's, that's the only one. I, did you change the setting? I think it's, I think it's good. It's just that, you know, some of those are. Yeah. And we can go through all this at the boards. Yeah, it's all, it's all yeah. boards. Yeah. So. It's the aerials a little. So, so the, this is the first roundabout location at Raymond Avenue. And we at one time had proposed a connection across Bernard. Um, between Bernard and uh, between Barton and Stanley, um, there's concerns about would would traffic backing up? Would someone be tempted to use Bernard? And we don't have that connection anymore, so traffic isn't tempted to do that. And we've stabilized some of the the grass for emergency access in that area, so we've taken that into account. But you can see those those little refuge islands for all the different trails coming together. Um, and then this is the rendering, um, look, this is looking along Stanley towards the roundabout, uh, where the roundabout would be, and then this is the um, artistic rendering or Photoshop rendering of what, what that, that, uh, that intersection or the roundabout could be. And I'll, I got one more to show you of, of Raymond. Are these, are these okay, Pete? Th these are good, okay. So here we are at Raymond Avenue um, heading north towards Stanley and towards, uh, the, the, you know, a little bit south of uh, Stanley. And we do curve the traffic in to the roundabout, slow it down to a reasonable speed. And actually, this is a little bit better of a depiction. I think it's on the next slide of, um, you can see how where there's trail crossings, 
where it's trail to trail, we've added like a green crosswalk type feature. And this isn't a design plan, but that's the intent of our renderings is where the trails really come together. So it'll also be intuitive, like the best way to follow the trail network is if you see the green crosswalk, well that's part of the trail network. So that's the intent of that. This is a bird's eye view looking north of how all that would come together. Okay, so now we're on North Street. My image okay? It's hard to tell at this angle. It looks good on my, to my screen. Okay, so you can see we've increased the, the, the pond at, at, at both Bernard and then what we call the duck pond, and we've reconfigured that. It works better for the park and better integrate the parks and the trails from the park network converge where the roundabout is at Virginia. Virginia, I know, is a major north-south roadway like collector in the neighborhood, and it's got sidewalks, and it's a good way to connect and get people to have safe crossings to access the park system. So that's specifically, and we had the room to do it in that area. Then to the east, we've narrowed the roadway as much as we could. We've maintained some medians, and we're at the signal at Palm Springs. Um, we are um, upgrading the signal, we're replacing the signal and putting in some textured pavement. Uh, I will note that in the future, we have future phases to extend the trail network along North Street towards Ronald Reagan and to extend it south on Palm Springs down towards the Altamont Mall. So really that connection of the trail network outside of the park area at this intersection is really important for the overall trail network connectivity. And then you think getting used to my, my images now, here's, here's, you can see how we've got all those separated crossings at each location and that ties into the park. And then here's a view if you're heading east on North Street, approaching where the roundabout would be and you can see the fountain in the background. And, and I'm, I'll be working with the, the parks team a little bit to make sure that we have a great um, fountain focal pe feature right behind the roundabout in the distance to terminate the vista. I can talk a couple of kind of parks planning terms even though I'm a transportation engineer and planner. Pete can't have all of them. So this is heading west along North Street and you can see we're kind of looking off to the right a little bit and then you can see with this we're curving the, 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 v, the roadway and then we've added the roundabout and like you can really see how you can cross halfway and then cross the other half of all these, these roads. And then finally, here's the, the bird's eye. And technically, you can see in, this, in the upper corner on, across the Nelson Avenue um, location is really where um, Pete's trail network would be a trail-to-trail -trail connection. So we've got that like in the green crosswalk. So if you're a user and you get used to it, you know that's probably the best way if I'm staying on the trails to go. Still a good crosswalk every other way and marked, but it's just another intuitive way um, in transportation we can communicate with the parks. Okay, so the last corridor I'm gonna cover is Palm Springs Drive. And this one, we've, been, we've, we've got a little bit more room to do some different things, but we also had some challenges with how some of the roads come together and some different funny angles and trying to work through how to do that. So what we've been able to do is we've, we've kept, we've narrowed the roadway itself and we've kept the uh, room for the trail from the intersection of Palm Springs. And then we can up, up to the park area. And then you can see off to the right, and you can see this on the boards, we've, instead of just continuing the existing sidewalk right up against the road, we've provided a spur out to the trail network so that you're not, you no know, one's gonna walk right next to the road if you can diverge a little bit away from the park and we've integrated with the park plan so it's a better use, more green space, um, a better experience for the network. We've kept a roundabout at Stanley Street where the parks really converge. Um, at the uh, intersection of Orlando Avenue, we had to do some realignment to make sure that we have act good access for fire and, and, and garbage trucks and things like that. And we've got like a raised intersection at that location. And then we've got some areas north of there right next to the park where we've got some, um, what we're calling some curves, some diversions in the roadway or chicanes. And I've got a couple of views of that. And then north of, of the very northern part of the, of the park edge is a trailhead. And then there's some raised islands to try to calm traffic towards 434. 
And here's a, here's a more zoomed in or rendering of, of, of what's happening at Palm Springs and Stanley and how the trail network would kind of all come together and we've provided some good median crossings or raised uh, crossings and then the roundabout crossings as well. And then next, I was just trying to explain what a chicane is. It's just, it's just a little bit of a curvature of the roadway within a generally straight line path. And we've got a rendering of how that would look. And it's out on the boards, and you can look at it and ask my team more details, where we've actually really looked very closely about where the tree canopy is and trying to preserve where the trees are and placing where the islands would be so as not to impact any of the trees that, that Pete and his team said made sense to keep and that they were good, healthy trees. So we've really kind of thought through which way the lane shifts are happening um, back and forth. So with that, we're just gonna just touch on the next steps and timeline. And really, Pete, this is really just about the different packages you've talked about and then just the improvements happening later on in 2024. Um, I know yeah. there's a groundbreaking ceremony and there'll be continued phase improvements. But I don't know if you want to touch on anything else in the Yeah, I, I think the only point was we got into a little bit of a conversation as we were putting this slide deck together is, you know, well, do we think it'll get bid this month or it'll, it'll break ground this month? And it's, you know, I think we're not ready to, to give you an exact time frame, but clear it's going to happen this year. Uh, we're going to get started. The drawings are getting done and we will be in some manner of construction in the fall um, for sure um, and probably sooner. Um, so this is coming. And I think just to kind of wrap up what Jeff said is, you know, I'm, I'm real happy with the idea that the, street, the streets really become part of the park. And, and to Jeff's point about the roundabouts, I think one of, the, one of the key things that you can just keep in your head, nobody ever sped up to get through a roundabout, right? It's just a fundamental idea. So folks will, folks will really drive in a way that I think is protective and respectful of the park. Um, I want to give you, um, this will all be online, and it's going to be actually on two different places, and I see a couple of you with your phones up, so I'm going to give you a second here. This is on the county's general webpage, um, and this entire presentation will be on there, so you can not only see it, but we're recording it so you can hear it. Um, the, 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 the things that we're saying will be synced up with the slides. So this is a location. Um, and then another location is some of you know that we actually have a separate uh, sort of specific web page just for Rolling Hills Park that actually has all that history and all those old presentations and old videos and things. It'll also be at that location and you can, you can QR this as well. So this, everything tonight will be in both of those locations on the county's website.